I was born into a family where child sex trafficking was the norm. Because the more I could do and the more alluring I could be, the more money they would make. What I went through, I'm very lucky to be alive, frankly. Um, I'm so grateful I'm here and I can hold my head up high because I made it through to the other side. But there's hope, there's hope for everyone and that's what I'm trying to show. And I'm Laura Word. Welcome to our live program discussion focused on male survivors of childhood sexual abuse, sponsored by Men of Voices Beyond Assault. As most of us here today, Laura Word and I are also survivors. Voices Beyond Assault recently started a men's division because we understand that men's voices are not always heard, and we want to amplify their voices, empower them to heal, and provide resources that are needed. At that, let me introduce our guest today, Gloria Masters. Gloria is a survivor of horrific abuse and sex trafficking by her father beginning at the age of four, with knowledge and assistance from other family members, including her grandmother. Gloria's horrific experience continued well into her teens and are chronicled in her book on Angel's Wings, My Flight from Trauma to Grace and Flight Path to Healing. Since becoming a survivor, Gloria has dedicated her life to helping other survivors, and we're thankful for that, Gloria. She founded Handing Back the Shame, an organization devoted to helping survivors of CSA come forward, tell their stories, and begin their healing. Through this organization and its video channel based in New Zealand, Gloria has provided a safe platform for many survivors, both male and female. That's right. I had the pleasure of being one of Gloria's guests, and I can only hope, Gloria, that we provide an experience as caring and fulfilling today as the one that I experienced with you on your program. Gloria, it's truly our honor to have you join us today. We want to thank you for getting up so early to join us live from New Zealand. <laughs> thank you. Pleasure to be here. So Gloria, we want to start by, you know, we always start by going into, into our survivor stories and yours is a very tough one to tell indeed. And, and um, so only please, you know, feel free to only tell us what you feel comfortable telling you again, this is a safe space for all of us, just like it, it is on your program. And I, I encourage everybody to go uh, and we'll give you the information at the end of this, uh, how to get a hold of Gloria's content and programs. And she's done a lot and we're gonna get into that in a minute, but let's start with uh, your journey, your, where, where it started at four years old. And I mean, at the age of four, the memory has to be, you know, uh, I mean, I find a hard time remembering when I was four, uh, but you, it's pretty vivid for you, isn't it? it? It's also, I don't know if other survivors feel this, but it's also sometimes images and flashbacks. So I can describe a little dress I was wearing during one of the occasions I can tell you about the little daisy chain I was making uh, so some of these um, memories are kind of, they come in little snapshots as well but I'm very grateful my mind protected me so uh, from this until I could deal with it um, basically uh, just a synopsis unless you want further or more detail I was born into a family where child sex trafficking was the norm and being uh, a young girl I was 
first uh, raped by my father. I was abused from him from the time I was born. The rape just didn't happen until I was four. Um, but he had extended family and friends get involved as well and realised he could make some money. At the age of five, five and a half, I was then trained by his mother, my grandmother, into uh, becoming the best uh, child sex worker I could be because the more I could do and the more alluring I could be, the more money they would make and my grandmother would get paid commission for this so over the years this just got worse and and grew more horrendous um, a pivotal point for me was at age 11 when my parents separated and I was left with him so although I had experienced trauma beyond belief up until then that nightmare then took off exponentially and that's when real torture began for me so I had many um, many perpetrators and what I went through I'm very lucky to be alive frankly the the kind of some of the things I went through were being taken to Freemasons once a month uh, satanic ritual abuse would occur. I was also leased out to gangs. I nearly lost my life at one of those initiation ceremonies. Um, I was leased out of a nightclub in our red light district in Auckland, New Zealand, on the top floor. I was chained to a bed for some of that, and both men and women were my abusers. So you know, there was, there was a lot that went on. Um, I won't use the term and I encourage you listeners and you guys never to use child pornography, please. It minimizes what it is. It is child sexual abuse materials. And each one of those acts, whether it's a film, a videoing or a photo is a crime scene. Every act is a crime scene. So there are many, many of those, well over a hundred of those were made, many, many pictures were taken, and the police report they are in the States, some of them are. So my grandmother also performed abortions on me as I grew older, um, and again, I'm just very grateful to be here. So that's kind of a synopsis. Um, I'm so grateful I'm here and I can hold my head up high because I made it through to the other side with love and light and grace. Not many do. I mean, a lot of people don't, right? Um, yeah. So we're, we're thankful for that too, that you made it and you've done such incredible work. Yeah. It's, it's always amazing and beautiful to see people who have just gone through the thick of life, you know, by no responsibility of their own, by no fault of their own, and decide, you know, I'm going to take this very painful experience of mine, I'm going to take this very horrid experience of mine, and rather than trying to put more of it back out into the world, I'm going to try and transform it into something beautiful. And that is, that never stops being beautiful to me. That never stops to like amaze me at our human spirit to be able to change the meaning we assign to our lives. And so, again, we are so so excited and thankful that you're here um as we're hearing a synopsis of your story you know i'm hearing a lot on your father and your father's mother and could you just give us a little picture of like what was the other side of the family looking like you know what did your what was your mo mother's involvement did she know kind of walk us through that a little bit yeah so my mother was a classic narcissist so all roads led to her and her reflected glory. If I could give you a, a phrase to sum up my experience around my mother growing up, I was just in the way. So I to to neither parent really was I a child a beautiful child, which all children are, and we should be grateful there, you know, we have them ourselves or that they're part of our lives. I was an object, so if you can imagine, for my mother, if I could provide what she needed, so think parentified child, 
tip it on its head. A, a parent is meant to protect, care for, safeguard, love, put their life ahead of. Yeah, makes sense? The opposite was true in my case. So I had a mother who wasn't interested and was often absent from the home and her uh, family were equally disinterested, frankly. And then I had a father who could make a great deal of money out of me. I, I never once had a conversation with my father that was about me. There was... You know, I know what a beautiful dad you are, Craig, and, and the love you have for your children. And although I know you would have got it wrong at times, as we do, um, I never had a dad that ever asked anything about me. The only kind words I ever got were if I made him enough money um, or made him more than he was expecting. That was it. I didn't really have a father. I didn't really have a childhood I'm probably, my kids would tell you, I'm more the child now at, at my old age than I ever was. So, yeah, I'm going to make the most of life and enjoy it. Yeah. So you you said, um, so I'm trying to figure out, the your grandmother was involved in this and she actually taught you the moves and the ways that, uh, about the, was she herself uh a victim of, of trafficking when she was a child or did she, did it start with her uh, generation in this family? Cause you said you were born into a family of trafficking. Did it start with her or did it go back further than in her family than in past that? Did you ever find that out? Yeah. Well, the, the couple of things there and great question. A, she was paid to do this. So this was a transaction. This was a business, but B, of I I don't know when it all began, but I don't think I I don't believe it began with her generation because she was so comfortable with teaching me what she was and not seeing me as a child. So where you're dissociated from from actually a small child with you know the first teeth coming out, <laughs> you know. Um, there, there's, there's got to be a reason for that. I, I believe she obviously experienced something herself, but I believe it went way back. I, I actually think this type of behaviour, whether it's child sexual abuse or trafficking or whatever it happens to be, is very typical and it didn't begin in the year 1980. I think it be it's been around since time began. I suspect in the Victorian era, did you guys know that young children would be sitting underneath the dining table performing oral sex on the adults at the table while they were eating? So that's wow. one story. You know, it's this is not new. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, wow. well. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so you know. You're talking about camera that there's a lot of family dynamics here and you had mentioned you know once your parents divorced obviously things take a turn so could you kind of talk us to about that like what what had happened after your parents had divorced oh well my heart sinks as i'm telling you but uh the i became like cinderella except i I wasn't really allowed to eat because the thinner I looked and the more malnourished I was, the younger I looked, which meant I was more attractive to the pedophiles. But more than that, my father was a deranged psychopath, and I call him that in the book, um, because what he would do, this is just one example of the type of trauma and abuse that I suffered, he would strip me naked, tie me up like a dog and then make me walk around the house like a dog on all fours and I was not allowed to speak. So all my communication was in dog language, barks, yelps, whining, panting, all that sort of thing. And my brother was complicit in all of that as well. So he became my father's mini-me. So I was left in the house with my brother and father and 
Yeah, that that was probably the worst of it for me. If you said what was the worst, the sexual abuse, the physical abuse, or the uh, psychological, it was a psychological, without a doubt. So if you, you asked to your brother, your brother no. had to go through the same thing you did. Though. No, uh, he, the opposite. He was he was uh, perpetrating against me. He would get his his friends would be allowed to come round and was they he older would, brother older brother yes, yeah yes beg your pardon yes four and a half years older so the the point being that I had not one but two big big men yeah. around me it felt like and I just had no escape and there was nowhere I could go but there's hope there's hope because I couldn't trust anyone because police were involved and so even though people will often rant as they do on social media, why didn't you go to the police? Why didn't you get help? To be honest, when you see back in those days, it was the black and white paddy wagons, cops, I des- I was screaming for help. But they were some of them were involved, so I didn't know who I could trust, so I chose not to take more risk. But I can't quite recall what you were asking. No, it was, uh, I think it was Lauren, your question, right? And it was, uh, it was about at, at age 11, so you just told us why it was so horrific after your parents yeah, divorced yeah, you. Yeah. Were, you were 11 only, right? And you so your brother would have been about 15. He sounded like he was being in to be your your father's yeah. footsteps. Um, and and there, was just, there was just no out for you. I mean, oh, I was how talking did you... Light with them. The light within, I always found a light within. So what happened was, sorry, I forgot where I was going. Um, Craig, I need to finish this because it's valuable. Sure. Because I couldn't externally trust anyone, everyone felt complicit to me, I learned to go within. And so what I found there was a light that shone so brightly, it gave me hope. So well, I just that was found what I was going to ask you. So that it's perfect because I was I was thinking, you know, how do you how are you in a situation like that at eleven, and you don't want to just die? You just don't want, you know. I mean, it sounds like you were in like, like this terrible prison environment, no love, no no love for the your captors and two of them, and how do you go on from that? You know, how do you how do you not find the nearest weapon or something and just want to you know i don't know i mean it's it, it's i we've all been a lot of us have been there as survivors i was there i think i told you um at once uh i don't i don't know but i your situation was just seemed so hopeless and you had this light within you that gave you hope and, and well, where do you think that you're... came from yeah, so look, you're not wrong. I did I did try and take my own life three times between 11 and 16. But I keep getting it wrong. I, you know, I just I just couldn't do it. Um I mean, I tried, but I wasn't successful. And so I don't I don't think you need those details, but all I'm saying is I did try. And, so where did uh, the light come from, Gloria? Well, because I could only go within I, I had no one out there I just would close my eyes and and you know say help me help me and then I would feel something and and I would see this beautiful light and then when I and it felt reassuring and it felt hopeful and I would see then it, outside of me I might look up at the moon or I might see the stars and I just always found myself noticing light everywhere and I'm so grateful that I had that, and to this day, the light is everything to me. And uh, I'm not trying to discount the impact or the horror, but I am saying I had nothing. I had no one person living who I could trust, so I learned to go within. And I think that's why I'm here today, maybe. I'm here do, you to think, was the light, do you think the light was spiritual or within you or or well I, we all have created? different you yeah I think we all have different versions of that and 
I'm I don't believe in God as such. I I believe that we all have, if you like, God within us or a light within us. I believe that there is something beyond who we are, and it's that for me. So yeah, I don't I don't tend to classify, but I know that it saved my life many times. And people would say, what do you mean? How could you even look at the horror you went through? Yeah, and look, uh, part of me wishes I'd no, I never had to go through it, but I did. But the other part is grateful because I wouldn't be who I am without what I went through. And look at the people I can help. I get people from all over the world feeling hope that weren't so one one survivor has helped wow isn't that beautiful so i'm meant to be here it is it is beautiful and i, I had a a priest at uh my college who said uh you know and a lot of people have said this if you can help one person then your then your life has value and yeah. you've helped a lot so yeah so um circling back i'm assuming glory you have like no contact with any of your family members today well you know it's interesting i tried for years to have a relationship a continued relationship with my mother because who are we without a mum you know i'm a mum and uh, although i do get it badly wrong and they roll their eyes and go, oh, mom, don't even say that again, you know. <laughs> the, the point is I'm a loving mum and I'm an available mum. And I guess what? I'm not a narcissist. But um, I tried for years to have a relationship with my mother, but she would only allow that shock horror if I would cut off that part of me that was abused, if I would never speak of it again never raise it with her again, then I was allowed in her life. So I kept trying. I took a lot of healing and a lot of decades of unpacking. But one day I realized I can't keep knocking at a door that won't open. She won't accept me. And to be fair, she never did, <laughs> did yeah. she? If she had seen me for who I was as a young child when I really needed her, um, she, she knew would. this was going on, did she not? Well, there's always the the feeling that how could she not? But more than that, when I used to see her on weekends, um, every second weekend I was allowed access to her, I would um I would do what traumatized kids do. I would cling to her, I would cry, I would beg, I would hide. So I didn't ever have to go back, but she would always send me back, you know, and uh, it was it was very surreal. And then there came a twist. So the twist in the story is at age 12 and a half, I came home from school one day to my father's home and there were um, I could hear sounds giggling a woman and I went down walked down the hallway and there he was in bed with a woman and I just went into a really big trauma response and the reason for that is that not only was he been was he had he sexually abused me and trained me for years I had kind of become his pseudo mistress at home if you like like I, I did everything at home because I was the girl and the slave, but I'd become his mistress, so I had to sleep with him. So part of my childlike mind just went into shock and I turned and I ran and I ran to my mother's house and she said for the first time, what's happened, what's happened, why are you here, what's happened? And I was just shaking and crying. And eventually I told her he's got a woman in his bed and I don't know what to do, you know, that job's mine or something. And uh, she conveniently, conveniently forgets that part. And uh, what 11-year-old says that? Well, 12-year-old says that. But anyway, uh, and then yeah. 
then she says, well, you'll need to stay tonight. You'll need to stay here for now. She rang the priest, the Archbishop of Auckland, and they said the words that I think did save my life. Get her out of that house. She can't be living with an adulterer. So how long did you stay with her? You went back after that, didn't you? But my point is, let that sink in, Craig. Yeah, this, yeah, you're, I, I get your point. The abuse, you, the torture. The... What you said to her, that it's your place, but yet the reason that you're removed is because it's an he's adulterer. An adulterer. Right? Not because yeah. he's a child sexual abuser. Or he's Not because he's trying to get yeah, he tried to kill me many times as well. Anyway, but look, the whole point is, I thought, yeah, I'm free. I couldn't believe it. You can imagine the sheer relief, the bone-shattering relief. Or so I thought. Until a few days later when she made me tell him, she wouldn't come in with me, but she made me face the biggest evil, frightening man in in the world and tell him I didn't want to live with him anymore. And so that was that. But then a few days later, she said to me, you better get ready. And it was a Friday night, and I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, your father's coming to get you. And I said, no, no. Remember, I'm not allowed that. No, no, she said. The bishop agreed that um, you should still be able to go every second weekend. So can you imagine the punishment I received over that weekend, living with my, staying with my father? And then the horror was for 12 out of 14 days, I was safe in half of school holidays, yeah, relatively safe. I was ignored, you know, no interest at all in me whatsoever. But you were kind of happy to be ignored over what, what I was, was just I, I just was exhausted. Yeah, I was but I'm yeah. just saying it, there was no love there either. But the point was for 12 days and then two days of that. So you tell me what's worse, because to me it was easier for me to just have been living there the whole time. The fear, the courage, the absolute, what I had to find in myself to cope with those two days. Can you imagine that? So that was a whole other, whole other psychological nightmare for me. So you're saying it was easier to go back and just live with him permanently? It would have been, to be too. honest, it would have been, well, think about it, Craig. I, I'd walk away from his home. The girl that left my mother's house every second Friday was never the same girl that walked home on the, the, the that returned to my father's home and vice versa. It was never the same because, you see, the trauma in, in us is such that when you think you're safe, you're free then to start to feel again, yeah? You're free then to start to acknowledge how tough it actually was because you're out the other side. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But how is it then if you have, have to keep going back into it? Yeah. So that's what I mean. That's actually more psychologically damaging, I've been told, than to have continual because those respites were not respites. All I had to do was try and sleep, try and eat, try and function before ramping right up again to becoming the child that would perform sexually and be beaten and be tortured. So no, it wasn't it wasn't better for me at all. Just the the constant whiplash between two extremes of I'm being ignored and not cared for and I'm being abused and uncared for still. And just constantly vacillating between these two is, is, is extremely tough. And it's hard for a body, especially a, a child who's so young, to like adapt to those circumstances. And uh, yes. Yes. you can only imagine what that is like. You know? Yeah. How I made it through, you know, because I know Craig's going to move to that. How did you make it through, Gloria? <laughs> so I, I had the beautiful light. But I also noticed little angels around me. 
and I would notice wings. And that's why my book is on angels' wings, because I felt I had um I had I felt I had little little a little army of little angels around me. So you know, whether or not you would call that a childhood friend, although as much too old to have a childhood friend. <laughs> Uh, imaginary um the reality was I felt loved beyond what I could see and I felt their presence and to that's, be a, that's fair, amazing do you ever want to go further into that personally and find how that can because I don't know how you still have that with when you were going through what you had um I think it would be interesting to examine that even closer. Like, where did that light come from? Where did those angels come from? Well, how did how did you, as this desperate child who was just being treated, I can't even think how badly. I mean, I just can't even comprehend it. Have have this this light there, and it's it had to you know for me it had to come from somewhere. Well, that I, as I said earlier, my spiritual belief is that within us is this. Within us, we all have this. And um, I was very grateful to be able to see it at a young age. People spend their whole lives, Craig, looking for this or trying to find some meaning or something beyond themselves that truly... Um, is is joyful and and offers hope you know the i think the the reality is i had a well-meaning psychologist say to me probably three or four years ago do you really think you went through all of that to do nothing with it and so because i am this person who has overcome and survived and because I am, and I always was, a an inquisitive, mischievous, fun-filled child, you can see it in me. I was always that. I was born that. And so it's only now, I you know, since my recovery, that I've been able to really tap into that more strongly. So yes, that has been explored, and yes, I'm grateful for it, and yes, I have my answers. But there, there's hope, there's hope for everyone, and that's what I'm trying to show. You exude that. It comes, it comes out when you meet you and when you talk to you. And from the moment I first met you a long time ago, uh, it does, it's there. I just, uh, I think it's incredible. I am a miracle. It's a miracle I'm here. You know, I, I had, uh, as you know, forced abortions on me which went very badly wrong uh nearly died I had my father trying to kill me uh you know when when you're a deranged psychopath I'm not asking you to imagine this but if you think and remember oh I don't know if you knew I was drugged so heavily that um and therefore my father was on quite a heavy cocktail of drugs as well so I don't know the. I don't think he was human at times. That's what it felt like because he would often wake up the next day and I'd be lying outside naked on the driveway, blue with cold, and he'd say, "What the fuck are you doing there?" I'm sorry to use that word. But okay, we just, we warned them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did give uh, a warning. Well, the the th I'm just being honest. That's what was said, and I I remember thinking, "You put me here." You tried to run me over in the car and you put me here. And I, I was told to stay here, so I did. But, you know, he he would often forget. So he would be in and out of whatever reality he lived in. Yeah. Or you, so, you had, oh, sorry. Continue, continue. Oh, okay. no, I, I guess what I'm saying is there were things that helped. I've talked about the light. I've talked about the angels. But I also had a love of netball. I would walk for hours so I didn't be home. If I wasn't home, they couldn't hurt me. Um, so I learned physical exercise is huge for me. 
even to this day, it really helps release something in me. It's no two surprises that on my um, my top two things in the world are meditating and exercise <laughs> because they ha- they saved me. They they gave me hope. They saved me, um, and I think that's what that was. Craig is the meditation is yeah. is where the light can emerge. The um, but you know I, I think we've got to remember that to to make it through something like this is highly unusual uh highly highly unusual you you won't meet uh many survivors like me who have experienced this torture um I, my story's been compared to um Auschwitz and I no disrespect to those beautiful people that suffered what they did. What a crime. But the reality is they had each other. I didn't have anyone. Mm. So you you're you're kind of touching on this a little bit where you're talking about, you know, a lot of these ideas had helped you really get out of the abuse that you were suffering through, you know, the light, yeah. the angels wings. And could you kind of touch on it a little bit? Like how did that kind of abuse come to an end and how did you kind of transition into that next stage of your life I know you had touched upon 16 being a big number for you yeah yeah so the agreement with my parents custody was the day I turned 16 I never had to see my father again so that was the best day of my life remains the best day of my life there was a court order or or what that was that was the the agreement they had lawyers involved and things that was the day day of 1016 so what happened after that was he kept trying to see me of course because his money ran out didn't it uh his cash cow ran uh, it wasn't there but my mother being the princess she was uh being the true hero she was um kept trying to manipulate me and force me to go and see him. And I just said, no, I wasn't the same child I was at 11. I wasn't going back. But he would turn up. He offered to buy me a car. He tried to bribe me. I wasn't going anywhere, so I didn't. Now, that doesn't mean it then all became roses, as you would appreciate. You had a very traumatised, dissociated, dissociative um broken teenager and so my life choices reflected all of that um so I was out of control back in the day we'd call it promiscuous that's all I knew was how to please men so I would do that um but it was all in an attempt to be close to someone or feel that love and uh, it's no surprise that I wasn't going to attract healthy men to me. So I, uh, if we then fast track, I could never take drugs because I'd been so drugged as a kid. They terrified me. Uh, but I could drink and I could eat. So I had an eating disorder and I would drink too much. And of course, we all know that no judgment um we do what we do to try and numb the pain and to try and escape the reality of what we survived um i married uh not the right person and i i won't go into that too much because i need to be respectful uh but all i know is i attracted men that reflected what i was templated with we're all templated with what And that was unlovable, slave, um, never put yourself first, unworthy, all of those things. And so I'm very grateful I had two beautiful children. And it was during those years that the memories and uh, the reality, the searing reality hit me. Because as we know, sometimes... Uh, for us as survivors things can become quite tough when children reach the age we were during our exactly 
Yeah. Did you, during this time, right after you left, did you, I mean, it is, I mean, if anybody in, that I ever spoke to in my life, uh, and I've spoken to people who have gone to war and, and experienced, you know, like death all around them, if anybody would have PTSD, I would think it would be you. And were you yeah. having nightmares during this time? And, and I mean, either, in addition to the eating and drinking and, and everything that a lot of us do, by the way, you weren't alone there. Um, but oh, no. how did that manifest itself in, in, into that? Well, I, I, I may not have, I may have shared this, Craig, I can't remember on our interview, but, um, they say that's that over seventy percent of PTSD sufferers are Vietnam vets. Wrong. It's people like us who have experienced childhood trauma, specifically child sexual abuse. And let me just do a little comparative study here. Vietnam vets, we're so grateful to them. They are applauded. They are paraded through streets. They never have to buy a drink again. They are given benefits. They are asked to speak at events and they are considered heroes. Would you agree? Um, yes, now today they are. When they first came home. No, you know, today. I mean, in the, yeah. in the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Compare that to us. Survivors of child sexual abuse, please shut up. That didn't happen. Do you really need to talk about that? Um, and we're, we're not valued, really. So I'm just saying that because that's been my experience and it is for many survivors out there. It's only in recent times in the last five years or so that people like you guys have started doing what you're doing and I've started doing what I'm doing. But before that, there wasn't a lot. So I'm yeah, PTSD probably only in the last huge. two or three years from now. Yeah. By the I'm way, so. trying to be generous in case you went <laughs> beyond that. But um, so yeah, PTSD. I was the queen of that. I I didn't sit still. Yeah. You see, if I could keep busy and distracted, then I wouldn't have to think. The nightmares. I'd try to stay awake all night if I could, because I did not want to close my eyes because the nightmares that came, I felt like I was in a tsunami. And each wave was bigger than the last and I was drowning. And I was trying to bring up two small children alone. It was a nightmare for me. And I you realized that I... it was related though to what happened to you, right? It wasn't like you you had buried your past and you were Yes, I had no I, I had. I had. I had told people in my teenage years and in my twenties, but I had forgotten that I had told them. So what the mind does is protects us. It protects us till we're ready to deal. So I'm so grateful my mind protected me. It was just unfortunate timing when I was also trying to raise two small children. <laughs> but there, be, there began the worst period of my adult life because can you imagine reliving that? Because that's what we as survivors do when we start to recall and face into what we went through. How did you know that that was the time that you needed to come to terms with what had happened to you? Okay. Because I knew that what was coming for me was needing to be dealt with. And I'll tell you why. To me, I felt a little nudge. I could start to get flashbacks. I had a couple of uh, men walk up the drive one day. And I thought they're coming to rape me. Why would I think that? Because I was being triggered. Because men coming towards me meant that was going to happen. So I even went out down to meet them and said, what are you doing? You're not welcome here. And then they said, we're here to do the surveying of the section next to you. But the point being, I was strongly convinced this was going to happen. So I had things like that start to happen, Craig. And although I wanted to ignore them and I was busy with small children, they kept coming at me. And in the end, I got 
pushed and then the tsunami hit and it just it got bigger and bigger so in my humble opinion what is for you will find you you are not going to escape what you are meant to escape in terms of your recovery and healing when the time is right your mind says yes and even though you would have given me the gold medal for resistance why would I want to open that door I no thanks but I had to I was terrified I I would wake up at night to knocking at the door and a skeleton would be at the door I would get up out of bed and go and answer the door expecting to find a skeleton that's this nightmares I was having and I just couldn't function I couldn't be a good mum I was exhausted I was just keeping as busy as I could and I wasn't coping and and then I it just it just hit me that I needed help so I started going getting into therapy and basically I've never stopped so Gloria, has therapy kind of been the main mode of healing that you've used? Or I'm sure there are other things that you've talked about where you really focus on the light or you look internally to see, I have this hope for myself. Um, because I'm sure for myself and for a lot of people, healing comes in a lot of different forms. And what works for you may be something that someone else has never thought, oh, this is a mode of healing that I can engage with. And we would just love to hear what some of those strategies for you have been. Yeah, look, I 100% agree. Great question. The I think there's 150 different ways to heal. Uh, what what appeals to you will work for you. And I always think that because survivors say, well, what if I'm not really a talking therapy person? Fine. Don't do that then. But find something that will help release it from your mind. So some people go rock climbing and talk to a mate while they're walking other people I did journaling because it helped release it from my mind and then I went and wrote the memoir um I also did a lot of physical activity because I felt if I it was releasing tension you see um and so I I, I enjoyed physical activity uh the other thing I, I did many things I loved playing netball so I used to play a lot of netball I loved being creative um so for for me it was more in writing but also things like I'd love putting I loved putting flowers together or baking or just just something that used my um my physically I didn't have to think too much but it was an expression I could express so to me the talking with a a good therapist is number one because if you get a therapist that you connect with and that you come away from feeling more enlightened and lighter you've you've struck gold that's what really worked for me but all the other things are very very important and you know it it doesn't much matters a, a lot of men here I know in New Zealand who are survivors do boxing because it's a safe way to release the anger because it, that all had to be suppressed uh through through the abuse so uh yeah is that useful oh is that what yeah you no it is yeah. have you have you thought of like other methods we hear a lot of people they talk about EMDR or using psychedelics to go um have you tried any know. of that or yeah uh, I mean, you probably you've interviewed people that have though I'm sure yeah I have and look I can't talk to what I don't know but I had enough drugs in my life to yeah. last me a lifetime and also keep in mind the torture I went through and partly through the three masons freemasons and you will have heard of this before was a little bit of mind control uh, uh you know yeah, so so the the point being, I'm not necessarily those things. Maybe weren't around as that uh, the EMDR wasn't a well known modality. Things like massage and Reiki and that sort of thing are really useful as well. Um, you have to feel safe yeah. though, because if you're going to get a therapeutic massage, you have to be prepared for what your body's going to give. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because it might yep. seem like a great idea, but you could be in a heap on the floor, at, you know, because of what your body's doing. No, started. I absolutely agree. I yeah. think it's just so, I think you guys were talking about it earlier that therapy is so um, individualized. So Brianna, who, um, how I met her, she's the founder of Voices Beyond Assault. And um, I was on a, a panel with her and she started talking about how she likes to, her therapy is pole dancing. And I, and I just started laughing because I didn't think that it was really like, she, I thought she was kidding. And no, she was absolutely serious. And she, she does a lot of work for women, uh, well, men and women um, here in, in Los Angeles where uh, it'll be like exercises therapy. And like you were talking earlier that, that you, there's a lot of different things I think you need to look for yourself. But do you think that, that healing, I mean, you said you're still in therapy and I am too. Uh, it doesn't ever end. I keep wondering that my wife keeps asking me, that, but I mean, I don't think it does. I think, I think it never ends. What well, look, I, 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 yeah. So maybe a slight disclaimer. I use it when when I feel I need it, uh, and yes, it does. It, it will end. Will we ever not be learning and evolving through this? I don't think so. I think we we will be challenged at times uh, and triggered, of course. And I shared with you watching uh, the sound of freedom really triggered me, um, but. You know, it depends on on where you sit with it. And, and hey, I don't think therapy, whether you're a survivor or not, is a bad thing, by the way. Yeah. And we're all just learning about ourselves, aren't we? And isn't that going to make us better and the world a bit better? Yeah, well, I'm glad you think that. But, I mean, when I was younger, uh, everybody around me, including my parents, thought that if you go to therapy, that just showed you a week. And and I'm glad that that has changed quite a bit for for people. Uh, but a lot of people, too, in, in another therapeutic way is to do like what we're all three of us are doing. And that is um, raising awareness, telling our stories, going out and and um, trying to, um, you know, do, do speaking and, and yeah. things like that. And you've written uh, some books. Uh, so how did you decide to, f so it's one thing to have to deal with, the, I found this, like it's one thing to have to deal with your abuse yourself in your own mind. And then you have to kind of tell the people that are around you because they're wondering what the heck's going on. But then to make that decision to go public and and to share the this horrific thing that happened to you, you have to share and you have to talk about it a lot. Uh, what 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 drove you to do that? Uh, I feel guided a lot. I get woken up during the night. I think my angels give me a bit of a tap and uh, I knew I always knew I would write a book one day and of course once that was published then people want to find out about you who who wrote this story um, and so I had, had only this may surprise you both but it was only three years ago where I could hold my head up high, look anyone in the eye and say this happened to me. Prior to that, I was shut down, shamed, demeaned, minimized, darboed, denied, attacked, reverse the order of victim and offender, which all survivors know well, um, negated, called deluded, evil, liar, whatever you wish to label me, I was labelled. And naturally that came from the people that were trying to hide the truth and have it never see the light of day. So something in me grew uh, quite strongly about I need to tell my story because A, I wanted to make sense of it a bit, but equally... I knew that if people read it, there would be others among us. Not to that extent. That's highly unusual, my story, and, and 
the ending of it. But the um, the fact that the child sexual abuse is so prevalent, and as I said, I call it the silent endemic. So to hold my head up high, took it was like Ab sailing off a cliff without gear, as we know when we first find those words. But I did, and I've got stronger. And what's made me stronger is the beautiful survivors like yourselves who some haven't yet found the courage. And I'm not advocating that you find a public platform. I'm just saying, even if it's a trusted friend. Or a uh, journal. <laughs> or a therapist. <laughs> yeah. So society didn't change necessarily. You changed, or was it both that, that allowed I, you I, to open I, your head? I, I grew into my wings. I, okay, great. <laughs> some people That's call what me I, I thought that was the answer. I just, I wanted to, uh, what did I you just say? Wait, that? I want to pause. That was a beautiful sentence, Gloria. I grew into yeah. my wings. That's just such a beautiful image to me. Like you're Thank this you. child who has these beautiful, large wings and you're just like, these are mine. These were mine always to begin with and they always fit me, but I grew into them. That, that was beautiful. I'm sorry. I just had to pause you guys right there. That's but... beautiful. Thank you for saying that. I'm quite humble, really. So, <laughs> But thank you. That's beautiful. I did. I grew into my wings and I meant to lead in some, um, meant to be one of the people who helps lead this forward. So one of the initiatives um, I'll just quickly share is our Global Awareness Day. We my charity um we released our t-shirts and they have how is this as survivors hearing these words across them uh, i see you i stand beside you i believe you touch my heart right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too it's it's uh i love that i love that where can we get those t-shirts <laughs> Would you like me to show you? I've got one. Yes, absolutely. Can you press record for a sec? Oh, yes, and I'll sure. Give me one I'll second. go and get the T-shirt. And... Perfect. Awesome. All right. This is the T-shirt that uh, Gloria put together, and you can see the words that she just told us. Uh, I see you. I stand beside you. I believe you. It's, it's amazing. And um, if you turn around the shirt, we can see this is a uh, handing the shame back is a nonprofit organization that Gloria started uh, only a year ago, and I'm surprised because I've heard so much about it uh, since then. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But if you want to go uh, and get a T-shirt, you go to what would you go to handingtheshameback.org? Yep. Is that the uh, yes? Uh, so. I'm going there right after this program. I can tell you that. Thank and you. I hope you have my size. <laughs> I'm sure we do. I'm sure we do. But thank you, team. And the reason I founded this was the reason we are having this conversation today. To uh, It's dedicated to all the beautiful adult survivors of child sexual abuse across the world. We know the numbers are frightening. We know there's massive silence around it. And... Um, I just, yeah, we, we I, I founded this because it, I felt there was a need and there, there was a need and part of that is uh, to address the need and have people feel less alone. And I know that, Craig, you'd said earlier, you know, it took a long time before you could tell someone and even when you did share uh, with Lord, you, you thought you were the only male survivor or for me the isolation I had for those 16 years even if I was surrounded by people I felt so different and so alone because who could connect to that life story you know yeah and, and yeah. so I, yeah yeah yeah. so you've done a lot of interviews I was interviewed Lord's going to be in one of your programs uh, coming up, how many have you done? How many interviews have you done? Sixty-three. So in a in a year. Just I do a little over you. I do one a week. Wow. That's, and I do a... yeah, but I, uh, the the beautiful thing is that's that's YouTube. So that's been running since January. That's been going eighteen months. 
And then the charity's been going since September uh, 2022. And on our website, we provide resources and support for survivors. So, for instance, um, I release survivor tips every week, though they might be a 90-second, two-minute clip, and a survivor tip might be, um, you know, the, the one that I just released was, uh, or it's coming out, is on survivor guilt. And for those of us, or those survivors who had younger brothers or sisters, they, they can often feel this dreadful guilt. So I just give a couple of tips around how to manage what to do when that occurs and also to encourage them to not own it and see the seven-year-old they actually were at the time, you know, that sort of thing. And then once a month, I have tips for supporting survivors. So for those who are married or in relationships, those intimate relationships can be really challenging. Partners, husbands, wives, etc., don't know what to do. So I provide uh, tips once a month for them to try and navigate that. And then the other thing I release every month is a, a blog. It's around 600 words and it's on themes. Um, so one of the themes might be on triggers. Another one might be on joy. Another one might be on shame. Um, but it's all pertinent to us as survivors. So there's lots of resources. It's all for free. We don't get funded. I um, I generate income through selling my books, um, but, yeah, not, not funded, and yet we are saving lives. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to circle back just for a moment. You said you yeah. had done 63 interviews. Like, yeah. I'm sure there's just so much knowledge and wisdom and life experiences that you've drawn out of these. Could you just kind of share with us some of these nuggets of things that you've learned from doing these interviews for your channel? Well, look, look, there's many. That one I shared with you was that every uh, child sexual abuse material, whether it's an image or a, a video, is a crime scene. So that came through one of the guests I interviewed. Um, another is, you know, that for people who are, you know, for you guys having a prostate exam or for women having a, a smear test, these can be highly, highly triggering. And, and, and what do we do with that? How do we navigate that? And so one guest said, you know, she likes the person to sit down with her for a few minutes beforehand to tell her her story and to say she would like to to have every everything discussed fully throughout whereas I on the other hand don't even look at me put on some music don't speak don't ask me anything just hurry the fuck up <laughs> get it <laughs> over with right so we're all different. So so those are some of the nuggets. Is that what you're looking for, Lord? Uh, there, mm -hmm. There's so many. Um, there's, there's things like I heard stats over in the States that the average age for an adult to speak out is actually 52 years old. 52? Um, 52. Yeah, yeah, that was me. Yeah. Uh, but, but that's, that's true. true. But, uh, I, I learn as much as I give. So I use them as yeah. a little bit of a teaching thing as well, if that makes sense, because I've got, in a good way, so much lived experience that um, often, you know, you can see a beautiful survivor in front of you and there's, they're holding on to some guilt or something, so or they don't recognise the beauty that lies within. So... I, I often do that. I always make people cry. It's my superpower, eh, Craig? Um, but, <laughs> but they're safe. And beautiful survivors, eh? We're beautiful, beautiful. But I'm so humbled to do this work. So humbled. Those are, no, that was um, so exactly was, what we were looking for. <laughs> show us your books and, and tell us a little bit about them. The first one, um, and we talked about uh, On the Wings of Angels. You, this is This is your story. And um, it's it's it's. Quite I, I love you. I love you, Although, Craig. It's on angels' wings. <laughs> um, so yeah. So that on the wings is... of the, sorry on angels' wings. You're right. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. 
<laughs> so this is me, Gloria Masters. And you can see my name at the top. And there you see the angel angel wings coming down. And uh, that's uh, an 11-year-old little face surrounded by the wings. And it's my flight from trauma to grace. Every word is true. There's a lot I didn't even put in there. But it's available on Amazon and all versions and including audio and on um, GloriaMasters.com. So that's a memoir. Yep. And that and that was your story. And then you decided to write a second one that uh, is, a, is a self-help book, right? So tell us yes. a little bit about Flight Path to Healing so I don't get that wrong. I, I'm glad you put it up. <laughs> Yeah, I'm 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 sorry if I'm correcting you. Um, no, but that's yeah. fine. So oh, I've got a bit of light. Can you see it? Okay. So flight yep. path mm -hmm. healing is a guide for child sexual abuse survivors. So it's only for survivors. Uh, although other people tell me they read it and find it helpful, but nevertheless, it's it's written from one survivor to another, and all it does is take you through. Um, some methodologies and some techniques and some tips that help to um, uh, allows you to face into where you are and where you may wish to be. So that hints the flight path. Don't you love it? Uh, so you're mm -hmm. on a flight path. Get on board. By the way, every survivor already had a boarding pass. You didn't know it, but you have one because you are a survivor. And uh, anyway, the the good news is I believe it's it's helping people and people tell me it does. So so that's that one. And show us a little bit of the the, the, the images that you were showing us earlier today. Um I can show you another one. So he he is one. This was uh in the kind of the meditation chapter or the going within chapter. Can you read those words? Mm-hmm. I am surrounded by love. My higher power guides me. I am protected spiritually. Yeah. Okay. And yep. So that's that chapter. And that is the all of those mantras can be uh taken out of the book because there's a perforation line and they're quite good size cardboard. Um, so they are mantras, and then we have so it's it's divided into several parts, but the first is kind of um, things that I found helpful for me as a child and then again as an adult. So I've, I've got a coloured block where I was the 11, 12-year-old and I talk about how I used those back then because they're not new to me, you see. Remember I've talked to you about exercise. Mm -hmm. These, those aren't new. And then I look at me as the 30 something who who also used those um then we look at the the commonalities the common symptoms for survivors so we have things like shame triggers flashbacks hypervigilance dissociation you know doubt feeling different boundaries all the things that we as survivors think yep i struggle with that yep that that comes to me so I go through each each of those and discuss what they mean and what we can do with those. And then I guess the third section is just uh, healing modalities. So, you know, for some of us, there's things like we we our lives can be a bit out of balance. Uh, things like our, our self-talk, things like self-love, because most survivors, we struggle to find enough of it uh, things like trust, hope, gratitude, all of those are looked at. And then the the uh, other part we move to is the healing modalities. And that's what you were asking before, I think, Lord. They and, mm -hmm. and people look at them and think, do we though? But here's a couple of ideas on those. So for us as survivors, we, you know, the healing modalities can be things like yoga it can be things like uh reiki it can be things like um you know group work energy healing meditation breath work there's a whole range of things i haven't included every single thing because i can't talk with authority on any of it i can only talk to what i've done so i haven't written it no. as a psych or a teacher of which i've been both I'm talking as a survivor, and that's I'm proud to be. I'm proud to be. 
But tell I, us about your third book. Yeah, I'm so excited about that book. I'm so excited. I um, what I actually have is it's called um. I want to show you a picture. It's called um. Should I stop recording, Gloria? <laughs> no, it's called Keeping Kids Safe. A roadmap for parents, teachers, and others. And what it is, is it's basically a roadmap because people don't know what to do if they see a child that might be signaling. They don't know what to do if a child discloses. They don't necessarily know how to support what is in front of them or where to seek help. And as a child who survived 16 years of horror, I've got a few ideas. I'm also an ex-teacher, an ex-psychotherapist, a mother, and a survivor. So I feel equipped to offer, just from my opinion, what works. Tell us about the hand signal, because its I don't think a lot of people have seen it before. Um, and yeah. how do we... How do we First of all, how how could that have helped you? And how do we get that out to every kid that every child knows that that's a signal? Yeah. So a couple of things around that. How would it have helped me? Oh, Craig, it, it could have saved me. Because I would have kept using it and until someone safe noticed. So the point is, I'm, I, I believe it would have worked and I so wish I'd had it. And that's why I'm passionate about it. What adults do is we have the construct that we verbalise and we talk to children. Stop that. Give them the tools they use. Children use their bodies. They use their behaviour. They show us through what they do that things aren't right. Here's a way to do it. So it's palm open. Do you want to do it with me in case yeah. your screen? Mm -hmm. Palm open, thumb across, close fist. Three three parts. Now, if you see a child anywhere doing that, they're in trouble. So I do have a story to share. Uh, this beautiful woman called Portia over in the States was uh, went to a Wendy's. She decided to sit in the restaurant and be mindful. So she put her phone down and mindfully ate and looked around. She saw a child of about 11, no coincidences in life are there, of about 11 years old, a girl sitting there with a man who she thought to be her father. The father, supposed father was looking at his phone and this girl started doing this real quick, but quite surreptitiously looking at Portia directly. This, this woman would be in her early 30s. She then thought, I know what that means. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? So she went around the corner, rang the police and said, this kid's signaling, I think, I think she's being abused or trafficked or something. What do I do? And the cops said to her, keep, keep them there. We're on our way. And she thought, well, how am I going to do it? So she went to a group behind her, a couple of guys sitting probably about your age, Craig, and um, said, hey, don't make a scene, but this is what's happened. I need your help. Can you keep him keep him there? I'm going to get get the girls. So she went up, and they said, yep, sure. They she, they went up to the table, and um, Portia said, oh, hello, you know, I love your dress or something. And the girl just launched herself at a meanwhile perpetrator got up these guys pinned him to the ground I think one of them sat on him and kept him there till the police came has that sent goosebumps down your spine yet it's amazing and but how did she know and how did the woman that saw her making that signal know how do how do you get that it, well because it, it's out? been released it's been released across the world but there's a lot more so you releasing it to everyone you know Lord and Craig, you don't know who you're going to reach. And and the point is, we need a, a global campaign. So that's why the Global Awareness Day I launched on June the 16th was um, 
was in part to release that signal because I thought, stop talking, Gloria, start doing. And we know kids do. They don't talk. They show us. So let's give them a tool. Now, full disclaimer, didn't come from me, that signal. It was released across Facebook a few years ago uh, as a domestic violence signal. But I've heard it since been uh, talked about and taught in schools in Northern America, uh, released in schools. So I decided to, rather than create a new one, I would use that and just try and, yeah. So that's what that is. Don't you wish you had that as a kid? Would you not have used that? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Right. Think about it. The more Would you not have just kept, pardon? And the more awareness we can bring and the more we can just continue and continue to share and let people know, hey, this is a coded message for a child that needs help. And we can continue and continue to share that. I think that'll be a great situation to have. Could have saved you yep. guys, could have saved me. It's yep. uh it's it's time, it's time for us to beat these pedophiles and perpetrators at their own game by giving kids the tools because we don't we keep talking about it and saying don't get in a car with so and so or don't tell us if anything's wrong kids can't we didn't we couldn't you know and so uh, the reality is why are we expecting children under 16 to be able to find their voices when we know the fear uh, and uh so I fly a lot, as you as you know, I fly a lot for my job, and Delta Airlines uh, has a video that they play um, where this little this little boy turns and he's talking to someone behind him, and he and while this his his abuser is there, and he says, you know, I can't I can't talk loudly, and but he, he, he they should have added the hand signal because i think that would uh do a lot so hopefully we can get uh a, attention from them because i think that delta airlines has childhood sexual abuse awareness as one of their key components uh for for their uh causes that they do uh from a business standpoint so um you know, it, you can't get it out enough, I don't think, because uh, um, I hadn't seen it before, I've got to tell you, and until you told me today. So it's uh, June 16th, that'll be an annual event uh, coming up uh, every year, and you, you started that, and um, is there, is it just national, it's international childhood awareness. sexual? No, no, it's called Handing the Shame Back Global Awareness Day because that's what survivors do. But there were three parts to it. One was releasing that hand signal, which I'm very proud of, very proud of. The second was we did a global awareness walk. So wherever you were in the world, at 10 a.m. on that day, you joined us. Now, for some people, obviously, in the States, it was 16 hours later. For others in the UK, it was 13 hours. But we had people from all over the world. We had people sending pictures with handing I'm handing the shame back with a group photo we we had some people from everywhere from Africa from the Netherlands uh from from everywhere joining us so it's a beautiful day and uh over the next 24 hours we just got lots of images the third initiative was we got everyone well we asked people and a nod to survivors swap your logo out with ours and they did so we had whole lot of our hearts our little hearts that are on the back of the t-shirt oh yeah that's absolutely beautiful and we're so thankful for all the work that you're doing there's so much that you've done writing your first book writing your second book working on your third book starting this organization giving awareness to a lot of causes and this is a really broad question i recognize the depth of what i'm asking but what is your ultimate goal with handing the shame back as an organization what do you what is it that that one thing that you're truly thinking if i could do this i think my organization has accomplished its mission i would love to see this on billboards everywhere handing the shame back with this (laughs) that would show me if we could get it on harbor bridges on billboards on backs of buses on everywhere 
let's stop talking about our kids let's start doing it and it doesn't mean you have to have the answers either by the way no one has all the answers but it just means like that really switched on woman she went around the corner and rang the cops and then took action you, you don't have to be alone in it. If you don't quite know what to do, take a photo of the number plate, for God's sake. Do something, you know? Like there are many, mm -hmm. many ways to, to deal with this. But anyway, I'm off on a tangent. Did that answer your question, Lord? Yes, yes, Absolutely. beautifully. And, and I think we're out of time today, but I mean, I just so appreciate you getting up so early and joining <laughs> us. And you, you you look like a million dollars at a very early uh, uh, time. So uh, just thank you. And and look, I mean, all of you out there, go to handingtheshameback.org and uh, you, you get a t-shirt. I'm getting one. Learn the hand signals. Help us move, help, help us make Gloria's dream because it's our all, all of our dream uh, to to really to end childhood sexual abuse and never have another child have to go through what Gloria did and what countless countless and thousands of other children go through each year in this world and thank you Gloria it, it was a very special program Thank you for for all the things you do, all the the hard work that you're you're working on and spreading awareness and taking a very terrible thing and making something good out of it. And that's uh, that's quite a gift. And and we feel we feel your wings and we feel your light. <laughs> Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Um, we just, we hope everyone has found this discussion enlightening and comforting. There's probably a lot of takeaways that people have had. Uh, please continue to look for our announcements for our upcoming programs as well. And hopefully, Gloria, I'll be interviewing with you short, soon enough and be able to have an announcement for that as well. And thank you again, Gloria. I, um, it was uh, quite amazing and you're amazing. Thank you. Hands on my chin, I was lost and looking in the glass of time. Was it just the wine made me cry? I hope I'm satisfied. I saw myself an older man folding up his paper plans and hiding it in his hands. Made me say, Am I? Tomorrow, too late tomorrow.